Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot for the invitation. So uh, I understand the, the audience is quite large. I mean, large in the sense that um, at least diverse. So uh, don't hesitate to stop me if I get into uh, too much uh, tech. No, I will not get into technical details, but uh, if anything is not clear, then just ask. All right, so, so this is a project. Um, uh, I will mention my co-authors in a second. Um, uh, it's about this, this KPZ equation, the two-dimensional KPZ, anisotropic KPZ equation. So I'm not assuming uh, you know what it is, but it will be, uh, I will define it. So, so the, the, I will start with a little bit of note motivations. I will start discussing a bit in general the so-called cadar paris zizang equation and how, it, uh, how it's related to so-called stochastic interface growth. And um, uh, so then uh, this, this will, we will be, uh, I will be discussing uh, mostly two-dimensional, uh, or only the two-dimensional, uh, two-space dimensional uh, situation. In that case, I will discuss there are two versions of the, of the equation that one, one of them could just be called the KPZ equation and the other one is the anisotropic one. That is for the, the, the one for which we have a result. And we is uh, Giuseppe Canizzaro from, uh, uh, from Warwick, uh, Dirk Herra from Bahia and myself. And our main result is about the diffusivity or actually the super diffusivity uh, behavior of, of this equation. All right, and then I will not enter the proofs in any way, but I would like, I hope I have a few minutes left at the end just to discuss some relations with other super diffusivity phenomena in other two dimensional systems. Okay, so as a very broad, uh, as a very broad, uh, as a remark, so uh, the very broad setting of this talk is uh, statistical, classical statistical physics. So there is, uh, I guess there are many quantum people here, but I mean, there is nothing quantum uh, here. Um, okay, so, uh, so let me start right away with, uh, with some, uh, with something about the KPZ equation. I, I okay, I, I imagine most of you have seen it once or another, but let me restart it. So, so the KPZ equation, and then I will come to the relation with the stochastic growth, but let me just start by writing down the equation. So the KPZ equation is a, is a stochastic partial differential equation. Uh, the, 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 the unknown is this H. H is a function of space and time. Space will be uh, d-dimensional in general. In a moment, we will uh, restrict to two dimensions. And uh, time is, well, time is time. And uh, so this H is a scalar and is, uh, is, a, is an evolving thing. So it evolves with time. So on the left-hand side, you have the time derivative. On the right-hand side, you have uh, other things that I will comment on in a second. And uh, okay. So it's a random evolution, and you, you should think of it, of this age as a, as a height function, depending on time. Uh, okay, so uh, on the left-hand side, we have the DTH. On the right-hand side, you have three terms. Uh, let's start maybe with the first one. Uh, this, uh, there is a, the delta H is simply the, the usual uh, Laplacian. Uh, nu is a, is, a, is, a, is a positive constant. So this part here is uh, a part, like a, if you had only that one, it, this would be simply the, the heat equation, dTH equals uh, Laplacian H. So this is a diffusive term that tends to, uh, to smooth down fluctuations. So if, if H has very wild fluctuations in space, this Laplacian part will tend to smooth them down. Then the last term here, this, this Xi is a noise. So it's a stochastic, it's a stochastic term. So you, you should think of this Xi as being a Xi of XT. So it depends on space and time. It's a noise, so it's a random, it's random, it's a random function. And uh, for instance, you should, you should you could think of a, 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 a space-time noise. So it's a, it's a noise term that depends on space and time. For instance, think of a, a white noise, which would mean uh, okay. So let me, yeah, uh, white noise would just mean that uh, the expectation of xi x t xi uh, y s equals is a Dirac function t minus s delta x minus y. So it's, you, can, you might think of the case where the noise is decorrelated in space and time, delta correlated. Okay, so uh, for instance, so you could think of other type of noise. And then the, the term in the middle is, the, is what makes the equation difficult, nonlinear. So here, this bracket is simply the usual scalar product in RD. Grad H is the space gradient of H, and Q is some d by d, uh, d cross d uh, matrix uh, that you can assume to be symmetric because uh, anyway, you are taking quadratic form. And uh, right, 
So this is how the equation looks like. So there is a uh, kind of damping term, diffusion term, uh, noise term, and this nonlinearity. And I will comment on this matrix Q in a moment. For the moment, is some matrix Q could be the identity or something else. And then there are these three, these uh, these uh, numbers, nu, lambda, and d. Uh, they are uh, they they tune respectively the strength of the of the Laplacian part of the noise and uh, well of the nonlinearity and of the noise. All right. So this is the how the equation looks like. Um, Okay, so this I already mentioned. So the lambda part, of course, it could be lambda could be uh, absorbed into the matrix Q. I mean, you can always do that, but it's convenient to have it outside, to have it as a kind of uh, coupling coupling constant or or parameter that you can use to tune the strength of the nonlinearity. So it's convenient to have it explicitly there. The parameters nu and d they will be fixed to some values once and for all. So nu I will always have to be one half, d to one. So these parameters won't appear anymore only the lambda appears and the, this matrix Q, which will play an important role. Okay, so, so the, Q, uh, um, the, Q, um, the Q matrix, this, this matrix Q uh, encodes somehow the slope dependence of the growth mechanism. That is, as I said, this H should be seen as a height function of some growing interface. And this Q, uh, according to how Q, uh, to what the, the Q, uh, how Q is chosen, this will make the, the dependence of the growth on the slope uh, different. Okay, so let me, uh, I think it comes in next slide. No, maybe in two slides. Okay, let, let, I will go back to this Q dependence in, in two slides or two, three slides. For the moment, this is the equation. Okay, so this is the equation, but uh, as most of you probably know, many of you, or maybe some of you, uh, this equation analytically is, is not well posed, at least if Xi is, as I said, a white noise. So a white noise is extremely irregular, both in space and time. So it's uh, I mean, it's really, really delta correlated in space and time. So, and as a, as a, as a, as a, as a PD, this is not well posed. So, uh, in the best situation, you can imagine that uh, the solution H has a regularity minus d over two plus one. So, for instance, in the one dimension, you 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 can imagine, for instance, if this is the case, if the nonlinearity were not there, the solution would look like a Brownian motion in space. So, this has a regularity one half, hold the one half minus. Uh, and in D dimension, this would even worse. Uh, the, the regularity of the solution could, would be over uh, minus D over two plus one. So it gets worse and worse with dimension. So of that, you have to take the derivative, which has the negative, uh, then a negative regularity, and then you have to take a square here. So this, as a, this doesn't make sense. So in the best, you can imagine the derivative will be a distribution, then you, you cannot just square it. And then uh, this is the usual, the, the well-known problem of the KPZ equation that the nonlinearity is not really well posed if uh, it's not well de defined if the, the noise is indeed uh, white noise. Okay, so this, this term here doesn't make analytically sense. Okay, but this is a well-known problem and somehow the natural approach as, as, uh, as one does often in field theory or whatever, in many other situations in, in mathematical physics, the, the way out is first to regularize and there are various ways of regularizing the equation. One way would be to regularize the noise. One other way that uh, we will follow later is to regularize this uh, non-linear non term. And um, uh, okay, uh, and then so so one one temporarily makes the equation well posed, then uh, studies it, and some and then some limit later what one would like to remove this the regularization. Okay, so the equation has to be regularized somehow, and I will be more specific on how we regularize it a bit later when I when I when I uh, go specifically into the equation we are actually looking at. Okay, and here, as promised, uh, the relation of this KPZ equation uh, to uh, stochastic growth. So the reason this equation was introduced by Kadar, Paris, and Zhang in '86 is that it uh, was supposed to it is supposed to uh, to describe on some mesoscopic scale. Uh, growth phenomena. So growth, you should imagine some, some substrate growing stochastically because maybe some molecules are, uh, are being deposed on the substrate or, or the usual examples are like burning fronts evolving or bacterial colonies and this kind of thing. So you should imagine some front that is uh, growing stochastically and you can model in many ways uh, microscopically this, this growth. So somehow in this very schematic picture, you see this uh, white, this uh, sorry, blue, uh, blue um, kind of random 
looking um, uh, interface. This is the, the actual microscopic front that is growing. Uh, it has some, some, uh, some, some overall slope, so I call it grad U. And macroscopically, this thing looks like flat, but microscopically, it's, it is not. It has some roughness, some, uh, some, some fluctuations. And uh, somehow, uh, the, the KPZ equation is supposed to describe the fluctuations away from the global uh, macroscopic growth. So macroscopically, this interface, for instance, if it's flat, it will grow like uh, linearly. It will grow uh, in time. DTU will be given by some function, some, some velocity, depending only on the slope of U. I mean, macroscopically, we just follow this, this deterministic evolution. But then microscopically, the, this blue, this blue uh, front will, uh, will, will evolve stochastically. And the KPZ equation is supposed to describe on some mesoscopic scales, which is not small, is not large enough so that you still see fluctuation, but not small enough so that you still, you, okay, you still don't, you, you don't see any anymore the, the, the discrete nature of the interface. Is supposed to describe the, how the fluctuations evolve. Okay, and heuristically or phenomenologically, what is the connection between the KPZ equation and some specific uh, growth model you might, you might, uh, uh, okay, so I see someone is uh, writing in the chat. Uh, oh, okay, so it was for you. Um, right, so uh, what is the phenomenological connection between the KPZ equation and uh, some, some growth model? It is that uh, this matrix Q should be, in order to make the connection between the, K the, the SPD, the KPZ equation, and some microscopic model, you, you, your favorite one, you should choose the matrix Q to be proportional to the Hessian of the speed of growth V, that is a macroscopic speed of growth, uh, seen as a, a, a Hessian for V seen as a function of the slope. Okay, so this is a phenomenological uh, connection between them. I will not discuss how it comes from, but the basic idea is that uh, this comes from saying, well, more or less, the height function H is the macroscopic one plus fluctuations. You expand the function V uh, uh, close, uh, around, uh, I mean, by writing H equals U plus fluctuations, and then you expand V to second order, and then the first nonlinear term you get is related to the Hessian of V. Okay, so I don't know how convincing that is, but, but just this was just to make a comment that this matrix Q has some physical meaning. It's related to the Hessian of the speed of growth V as a function of, of the slope. Okay. All right, so it has some, it's not some, some arbitrary matrix. It's, it has to be chosen according to the model you, are, you, you want to, to study. Of course, in one dimension, Q is just a number. It's a second derivative of V, but in higher dimension, it's really, it's really a matrix. Okay, and um, right. Uh, okay, so our, the goal we would like to, uh, to explore is uh, to understand how uh, this equation or uh, some, some growth models behaves asymptotically on large scales, uh, large meaning both in space and time. And especially the, 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 what we are interested in is whether the, 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 the nonlinear term in the equation, which is what makes the equation difficult, whether the nonlinear term is re relevant or not in a renormalization group sense. So in the sense that if this, if this um, term were not there, then the equation is exactly solvable. The its scaling limit is known is, okay, I will, I, will dis I will discuss it in a moment. And somehow the question is whether once in the nonlinearity is there, does it, does it qualitatively modify the, like scaling exponents and this kind of thing, so that we'll define in a moment, or this this uh, nonlinear term simply a small perturbation that becomes smaller and smaller as you go to larger and larger scales. In this sense, one would like to understand whether the nonlinearity is relevant or not. Okay, so it's it's a bit it's quite different than studying questions of the type give a, a, a develop a small time existence and small scale the regularity of the solutions. It, it's it's a different point of view. So I really, we really want to look at this, at this process on large and uh, large space and time scales. Okay, so uh, the first, uh, as, as, as often in, uh, in a renormalization group or uh, type of uh, problems, uh, a first indication on whether uh, a perturbation here, the nonlinearity, but could be something else, uh, is relevant or not, comes from a simple uh, scaling argument or a dimensional argument. 
And so it, here it works like fo as follows. So take for, for a moment, if ignore for the moment, the fact that the equation as written does not have a meaning because everything is irregular and so on. But for, pretend for a second that the solution exists and then call it H and then rescale it. And uh, by the so-called diffuse rescaling where you take epsilon, epsilon is some positive parameter and you rescale space and time uh, we rescale space as x over epsilon and time as t over epsilon squared. Uh, square is important in the diffusive rescaling. And then you overall rescale by this factor epsilon to the one minus d over two. Okay, so you call h epsilon this stuff, you put it back into the equation and what you will see is that this h epsilon will satisfy the same, the same um, equation as above. The only thing that happens is that the uh, nonlinear term, this lambda, is multiplied by a factor depending on epsilon as epsilon to the d minus two over two. And uh, xi is again a white noise. So at least formally, the only thing that happens is that lambda changes. And uh, so what one can guess in this case is that, uh, well, since this uh, prefactor epsilon to the d over two, minus two over two uh, goes to, so now we are interested in epsilon going to zero because that means large time and space. In that limit, this prefactor goes to zero in dimension at least three and blows up in dimension one and uh, stays what it is in dimension two. So this simple, uh, simple minded scaling argument just suggests, sorry, suggests that uh, the nonlinear term should become more and more relevant or large scales in dimension one, should become more and more irrelevant in dimension three and higher. And uh, well, in dimension two is the marginal situation where some finer analysis is, is required. Okay, but some, somehow already this simple argument tells you something that tells you that something happens at the dimension two. Okay, and in fact, the, the, the focus of, of all the talk will be on dimension two, but uh, I have a slide here on dimension not two, and it's a very condensed slide of many interesting and difficult work. So I, sorry, but it's uh, just condensed in one, in one slide just to give you an idea of what happens in the dimension not two. So, <laughs> Okay, so let me start for, first of all in dimension three and higher, where the scaling argument suggests that nonlinearity is uh, is not uh, is somehow irrelevant. Um, all right, so here I, the, the, I condense in one theorem a, a list of several of several uh, contributions. Uh, so okay, so here dimension is uh, at least three, and uh, here uh, the take the equation where you uh, take the particular choice where the matrix Q is just identity. So in that case, the nonlinearity is simply rad h squared. Okay, and then uh, look at the equation where to, to give to in order to make it to notice that it has a meaning, one has to regularize the noise. So instead of having um, instead of having um, a white noise psi, you take your white noise and you convolve it in space with some test function. So you take some test function phi, which is some bump function. You convolve psi in space with uh, with phi, and now uh, now now psi is now the new noise is perfectly smooth in space. Uh, the, 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 the equation makes sense, everything exists. So you can really say, well, let's, let's H, let H be the solution of that. Okay. okay, so you start from the regularized equation. You, again, you rescale it diffusively. And uh, the, 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 uh, the result, uh, okay, the, the cumulative result of some of, the, of these papers and others is that if you do this, if you do so, and let now this epsilon go to zero. Uh, so look at larger and larger scales. Uh, the solution H epsilon of this equation, uh, once you subtract some, uh, some non-random uh, drift term, uh, some function C of epsilon times T. So it's like a, simply a drift in, in time. This stuff here converges to H lambda as epsilon goes to zero, where H lambda solves the linear equation. So the nonlinearity disappears in this limit. The only thing that remains is that the coefficients nu and d are renormalized. They are not anymore one half and one. They are some functions of lambda, nu f of lambda, uh, d of lambda. Okay. So in this case, indeed, as, suge as suggested by the scaling arguments on large scales. Uh, okay. Sorry. Here I forgot to say. Did I write it somewhere? Yes, it's written. This holds for lambda small enough, but small I mean, means small, smaller than something independent on the epsilon. So it's small enough. So for small enough uh, nonlinearity, the nonlinearity becomes irrelevant in the large scaling, the large scaling, as suggested by the scaling. 
on the on the opposite side is dimension one. So here I didn't even write the reference as um, that would take uh, that would be too too long. But okay, so let me just condense in one line. What happens here is that here, as suggested by the scaling argument, the diffusive scaling is not the correct one. Otherwise, nonlinearity will just tend to explode. So what turns out in the end is that you have to rescale space and time differently by the so-called one, two, three KPZ, KPZ scaling. So here you have to define H tilde to be uh, H, eps, if you define it to be epsilon to the one half times H of T over epsilon to the three over two and not two. And eps, X over, so this is important that this is not two. And X over epsilon, so this is the different rescaling than a Gaussian, so then, uh, then uh, diffuse it. In that case, if you plug that into the equation, you will see that this H tilde epsilon satisfies the same equation, except that both the Laplacian and the noise get the factoring from that formally goes to zero with epsilon. So, and this somehow is the correct way of rescaling to, to see some, some non-trivial limit when epsilon goes to zero. So formally in the limit epsilon goes to zero, you adjust both these terms disappear. So it's a very, uh, it's a very strange situation. So formally in this, in this limit, only the nonlinear term survives. So, but in this limit, you get what is called the KPZ fixed point. So anyway, so the message here is that really in dimension one to get uh, some interesting limit, you have to rescale space and time in a different way than diffusivity. So it's really a different situation than, uh, than the nonlinear, than, uh, than the linear equation. And, and uh, yeah. excuse me, and the noise can be white or does it have to be colored? Uh, okay, so somehow if you, so like here, if you want to, to even have, uh, have the right to write down uh, H as, 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 I mean, you have to regularize it somehow. So uh, uh, the, like here, you, you, you first regularize it somehow and then take large scales. Okay, so, so to, even, to even have a, have a meaning, uh, to, to even being able to, to write down what H is. Otherwise, if you just take it white, uh, I mean, if you don't do anything, I mean, the solution cannot be given sense of, unless you go to, okay, in dimension one, you can do this uh, Kohlhoff transform. So like in this theorem here, what you do is first you regularize the noise, like uh, you, you're convolved with a, with a so size one support function, and then take, then take, uh, then take epsilon, uh, and then take epsilon to zero. Thank you. Know. Yeah. Uh, as I will comment in one of the few of the next lectures, once you take epsilon to zero, actually it is like removing the regularization. So you're kind of back to the to the to the white noise situation. That I will I will, I will, uh, I will comment on that in in a couple of slides. Okay, so but this was really um, about a quick uh, slide about dimension not two, and now from now on I'm, I'm I will stick to to dimension two. And, and just uh, another okay. question: yeah. in the case lambda large. Yeah, lambda large. Oh. Uh, uh, the it's it's expected to be it's expected that there is the transition to some uh, non-Gaussian regime for lambda large. What mm -hmm. is proven is only that these uh, these two things here diverge when uh, when lambda approaches a certain critical value lambda c, uh, which now I don't remember, but it's some uh, it's something that can be computed exactly. Uh, it's a kind of L2 threshold. But it's not clear whether it's the it, it is the real uh, transition point where some non Gaussian behavior emerges. But anyway, so it's uh, it's uh, this this um, irrelevance in dimension d larger than three is not supposed to uh, to hold for lambda large. Okay, there, there should be some strong to weak disorder transition. Uh, not you. disorder, mm -hmm. uh, small to uh, strong to weak weak to strong uh, non linear transition. Okay, so in dimension two, the, the expected picture is as follows, that what matters in this matrix Q is whether the, the determinant of Q is, la, is, small, uh, sorry, is positive or negative. Uh, in the positive determinant case, which includes the identity, of course, uh, it is uh, expected that the nonlinearity is relevant and that uh, uh, there will be two uh, universal exponents, zeta and alpha, uh, that uh, determine the growth in space and time of the fluctuation. So the zeta will determine the growth in time. If you look at the, 
how fluctuations grow with time, it will grow with some power of, of t, as a power of t for t large. And uh, if you look at how fluctuations uh, grow in space, uh, that should grow like a power also with some other power to alpha, the uh, alpha. And this, uh, these two, these two uh, exponents are known uh, numerically with some precision. They should not depend on Q as long as this uh, condition is satisfied. In this sense, they are universal. But they are not, they are not, uh, they are not uh, analytic predictions as far as I know about the actual values. And, but numerically, they, are, they have been studied. And the other situation is where the determinant is fully equal to zero, which includes the linear case, by the way, the Q is zero. And in that case, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's believed that uh, uh, instead the growth will be logarithmic in space and time. So like this. And uh, by the way, this is exactly the, the way uh, uh, fluctuations grow for the linear equation. Okay. So this, uh, this so-called anisotropic KPZ, KPZ class with determinant small equal than zero includes the linear case, which is nothing but the stochastic heat equation with additive noise, which is also called uh, edwards winkleson equation in the physics literature. So there are really these two cases. And uh, as you see, they are they are they are assumed to be uh, they are supposed to be uh, to behave in a quite different way uh, for for large uh, scales, and all the talk will concentrate on this second class, which is the only one essentially for which there are mathematical results in this in this uh, in this uh, in the, from this point of view. Okay, maybe I'm exaggerating, but anyway, the rest of the talk will be about the anisotropic case and this is this is effect. Okay, so uh, here uh, is, is an extract of, uh, of, uh, of, um, of the paper by Dietrich Wolf where this uh, scenario about the relevance of the, the sign of the determinant of Q was, was proposed. So here what he says is that if the two eigenvalues of Q are different, so the determinant is negative, then the nonlinearity is, is irrelevant for the scaling properties and the two exponents uh, zeta is zero and Z is two, well Z have not introduced it now yet, Z is a so-called dynamic exponent. You should think of it as follows. Z is, uh, determines how fast fluctuations grow with time. So you can imagine initially, you have something like very, uh, like maybe deterministic with the uh, things are like, or correlated, uh, delta correlated in space, something like this. And then as time grows, uh, the H becomes to be correlated the larger and larger distances. And this uh, correlation length, call it L of T, tells you up to which distance non-trivial correlations are present. This will in general grow with t. And if you, if you suppose it grows like the power of t, then you call one over z uh, this exponent and z is this uh, dynamic exponent. Okay, and the, the value z equal two is typical of the linear equation. And so the, uh, what, what is said here is that in this uh, class where the anisotropic class, the exponent should be two as in the linear equation and the growth exponent uh, zeta should be zero, as in the linear case. So there are not much more precise conjectures in the physics literature. So you can interpret this literally as saying, well, in the in this anisotropic class, the equation should behave like uh, the linear one in a more more or less strong way. But anyway, so this is a kind of conjecture you you find. So our goal was to make try to understand more precisely the, what is happening. Okay, so let's uh, all right. So let me write down exactly the precisely what the equation we are looking at. So we are looking at this at this uh, at this equation. So if there are any questions, let me know. So so we are looking at the uh, we are uh, uh, restricting to the anisotropic equation, and to the particular case where the matrix Q is the diagonal matrix with entries one and minus one. Okay. So in this case, the equation looks formally like this. Uh, the nonlinearity is d. Uh, so d one means d respect to the first coordinate in space and etc. Uh, so and the, the important thing is this minus here. Okay, so uh, this equation, uh, if there was a plus, I mean, we would be in the isotropic case, in the isotropic class, uh, there would be a, a nice thing available, which is called the Kohl-Hopf transform. That is, uh, if, the, if you take Q to be the identity matrix, somehow the equation can be line, linearized uh, by simply taking the, the exponential of it, if you take the exponential of H, and you call it U, the exponential of H, you can check uh, easily that it, then it satisfies a linear equation, which is still a non-trivial equation because it is still stochastic and the, the, the noise appears in a, in a, in a kind of a very singular way, but 
still it would, can be linearized. This is not the case if you have this minus. So this kind of this trick, which is important in the study, for instance, of the d larger than equal than three dimensional KPZ equation, cannot be used. So no cold Hobbs transformation is available here. But there is another thing that helps instead, that is in the case of this equation with the minus, which is the one we are looking at, one can uh, write down at least formally what is the stationary state of the, of the, of the process. And the stationary state is the so-called so -called two dimensional Gaussian free field. So if you, uh, what, what is that? Uh, okay, I guess for many of you it's known. So uh, H, uh, formally H, if you take H of X as a functional space, you should imagine H of X to be a Gaussian, uh, a Gaussian function of space, which is centered and such that uh, its uh, co covariance matrix is the inverse of the, of the Laplacian. Okay, so more formally, more, more precisely, uh, the Gaussian free field is defined as follows. For any test function, so take a test function, so a function of R2 with say finite support, for instance, and mean zero, uh, the, the integral of H of X uh, against this test function is the Gaussian, is a Gaussian var random variables, uh, which is centered and has a, a variance, which is the H minus one norm of, uh, of phi, or, or this, this uh, phi, uh, yeah. Okay, so this is the Gaussian free field. It's, a, it's, a, it's not actually a function, it's a distribution. And at least formally, you can see that if you take this equation, this nonlinear equation, and you start it at time zero from this Gaussian free field, it will remain the Gaussian free, the low at all later times, the low is still that of a Gaussian free field. So at least formally, the Gaussian free field is a stationary measure for this nonlinear equation. Okay, so and somehow uh, this is very important to, to know what the stationary, what the stationary measure is. Okay, so still this equation is well is, is not well posed for the same problems as, as above because this square doesn't really make sense. So as I said, one has to regularize it somehow. And the way we do it is twofold. First of all, for convenience, we, instead of working in the infinite space, we work on the torus. So we are, we are on L by L torus. This is not so serious. And the second more serious remark is that we, linear, we regularize the nonlinearity. So this nonlinearity is, is very singular. What we do instead is that uh, we, we regularize in, in Fourier space. So what this pi one here is doing is it, it takes, what it's doing, it takes a function. It, you take a function, you, you go to Fourier space and this pi one is ju just sets to zero all the Fourier modes with, uh, with the wave parameter k, k larger than zero, uh, larger than one. So if, if you have a function f, you go to Fourier space, you get half hat, it has some shape, I don't know, like this. And once you act with pi one, uh, what it's doing is just it takes, it's taking the Fourier transform of f and just keeping the part with k larger than, smaller than one. All the rest is put to zero. So it's cutting all the modes larger than one. So which automatically makes the function regular. So once you do that, uh, this nonlinearity is perfectly well defined because pi one h will be differentiable and everything you can differentiate, take the square and do stuff. I, I have a question about yeah. this Gaussian free field. I mean, it, uh, the free field is isotropic. It is uh, rotationally invariant. And yes. the model is, uh, is not. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, it's, it's a little surprising that. Uh, the model is, uh, if you, ch well, if you, yeah, you're right. So if you change, for instance, x to, well, the, for instance, you can, if you change x to y and h to minus h, the equation is invariant. And the Gaussian free field is also invariant in low. Um, uh, uh, um, yeah, I I agree. That doesn't look so. I, actually, I mean, checking that it require that it's uh, stationary. It's it's not so. I mean, in the end, it's not hard, but it's it's not obvious. I mean. Uh, it requires actually the, the symmetry that is behind that is really what I just said that uh, the, the equation is invariant by x over uh, x changes to y, uh, the x1 changes to x2, and h changes to minus h. Uh, th that is the symmetry that is behind the, wh when you want to check that the Gaussian free field is invariant, you, that is the symmetry that is actually behind. But, uh, yeah. but isn't, isn't the point that the station, the invariant measure is independent of lambda somehow? 
the invariant measure doesn't see the nonlinearity, and that that's why you have the rotational there. Well, what what do you mean does it see? Yeah, I mean it's it's uh, if you decompose the, the generator into the generator of the symmetric part and asymmetric part, both uh, both kind of preserve the the the, the Gaussian free field. That's right, the, but the free field is just what you get from the symmetric part, right? The anti-symmetric part doesn't change. Yeah, the but law. Yeah, that, that's correct. But I think the remark was that it was not obviously. Uh, the equation was not obviously. Uh... But, but the symmetric part is obviously rotationally invariant. Yeah, the, the right? symmetric part, yes. So, since that's yes. determining the invariant law, it uh, makes sense. I yeah, think. but yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the symmetric part is obviously rotation invariant. Maybe the, the anti symmetric part is. Uh... Yeah, but I guess, okay. Yeah, I, I think it's still, still reasonable to. I mean, the doubt is still, I, I think it's still justified somehow. Uh, uh, anyway, what you say is true. Uh, the, for the linear equation, it's, uh, it's, it's trivial to check that uh, the Gaussian free field is, is, is stationary and, and then uh, the equation is clearly a rotation invariant. And then, you, and then you have to check that the linear part still preserves the Gaussian free field. Thank you. Yeah, uh, as I said, it requires some computation, which is it's not obvious. Uh, right. Okay. So uh, okay. So this is what uh, what I just said in words. So uh, this is something that was realized in an earlier paper by Kanitsaro, Erhard, and Schönbauer, that uh, for every choice of the nonlinearity, and actually for every uh, for every choice of, of the nonlinearity, this Gaussian free field is stationary on the torus, and I will call this double bar, bar t the law at fixed time of this Gaussian free field, and then uh, uh, actually, okay, this is a nice remark, uh, I think. Uh, that actually the fact that this Gaussian free field was, is, is stationary formally was already known. And uh, in, a, in a nice paper by Cardar and De Silvera, they, 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 what they, they, they prove is that uh, the only KPZ type equations for which you have Gaussian stationary states are either in dimension one, where the stationary state is like a Brownian motion, or in dimension two with Q equal plus or minus one. Uh, in higher dimension, higher than Q, you don't have uh, higher dimension D, you don't have uh, cases where the stationary state is Gaussian. And in two dimension, Q equal plus and minus one is the only case up to rotations. You can, if you rotate the equation, you get other equation where still the stationary state is of course Gaussian. But other than that, if I choose for instance, Q equal one and minus two, then uh, the stationary state is not Gaussian. Okay, anyway, that's right. Uh, right, so what we want to do is uh, to remove the, cut, well, to look, Okay, to take the infinite volume limits and then take large scales. And we, from now on, we will only work at, on, the, on the stationary process. So with that, this bold phase P will denote as the law of the process at stationarity. So, so all what comes next is about the stationary process. This I want to make, to make clear. Another remark is that, uh, okay, you might be worried when, when I do this cutoff in Fourier space, it's like I'm removing all the difficulties. Well, this is not really the case. So if you look at, uh, okay, we have regularized in, in Fourier space, but the one, once you do this, uh, this uh, space time rescaling, so when you introduce this H epsilon, you put it back into the equation. And what you see is that this H epsilon solved exactly the same equation as before. And the, but the difference is that now the cutoff function is, is, multi, is, is, uh, is, is modified. That is, if before a scaling, uh, the cutoff cut all the Fourier modes larger than one, after you do the rescaling, it cuts all the Fourier modes larger than one over epsilon. So in the limit, epsilon goes to zero. Formally, it's like the cutoff has been removed. So actually going to large scales is like uh, removing the cutoff. So this is kind of uh, reassuring. We are not uh, eliminating the difficulty by hand. All right. Uh, okay. So this is what this is what uh, what we want to do to look at this equation large scales. And let me make a brief detour. So uh, as usual, I will be uh, will have to rush at the end. This is uh, what always happens. Um, let me break a, a brief detour on the linear equation. So this is a linear equation in two D. There is no nonlinearity. There is just uh, uh, Laplacian and noise. This equation makes perfectly sense, even though I mean the solution is a distribution. It can be it's okay. Uh, it's a Gaussian process in space and time because it's linear and then you can immediately see it's Gaussian in space and time. You don't need to regularize it, it makes sense. It's exactly scaling variance. This already is, 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 is visible from the scaling argument. If you rescale 
diffusively the, the law of the, of the solution stays the same. And then since it's the Gaussian process, it's quite natural to look at covariance. So take here phi to be uh, some test function and then ht of phi to be uh, the integral in space of, sorry, phi of x times h of uh, x, x, x t dx. So the process is entirely determined by the covariances of this ht phi at different times and for different phi's. Okay, so the whole process is, is, is encoded in these covariances here, or if you want in the variance of the increase of ht of h of epsilon from time of h of uh, sorry phi from time zero to time t. So it's the Gaussian process. This thing tells you everything. And this, uh, since the okay, so here and in the all the rest, I'm assuming the function phi has zero uh, has zero uh, average in space, so that it uh, the function h t of phi has a finite variance. Otherwise, the variance would be okay. Um, right. So. Uh, and uh, since uh, this, uh, this the linear equation is linear, I mean, it can be, can be solved easily in Fourier space. And what one finds very easily is that the variance of this, uh, I mean, this variance I just wrote down, uh, let me call it just V phi T of S H E for stochastic heat equation. You can write it down easily in Fourier space. It's this function here. And it's, uh, I mean, what it, what it does is nothing extremely exciting. So it starts from zero at time zero. Well, I mean, it's clear at time zero, it's zero. And then it grows. And then for t going to infinity, it converges just to twice of the variance of h uh, of h of phi. Okay, it just converges for large times to the to, to the asymptotic value. Okay, so it's some function. Okay, good. So this was a very brief uh, detour on the linear equation, and then let me come to the to the no no linear one. What we can prove about that? So I'm, let me uh, 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 emphasize what we want to do. So we have this uh, this uh, equation. We know that in the linear case for lambda equals zero, um, uh, if you rescale it diffusively, the equation, the, the solution is scale invariant. So the, 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 the law of H epsilon is actually independent of epsilon. So this equation, the, 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 the somehow the, um, it, it's already it's already scaling variant this equation. Whenever you you, you do the the, the, the diffusive rescaling, nothing changes in low. So the question is, what happens for lambda not zero? Okay, so here is the first uh, version, very informal version of our of our theorem, and it says that as soon as lambda is not zero, doesn't matter if it's positive or negative, the process uh, uh, be behaves quite differently. It behaves. Uh, it already evolves non-trivially on very small time scales. So it evolves non-trivially already on time scales of order one over log epsilon to some power delta. That is positive. This is the important thing here. And another way to see that is the correlation length diverges, which, which for the linear, okay, I have not defined the correlation length that will come in a second, but believe me in the linear case, the, what is, well, the correlation length would be just square root of T. And in the nonlinear case, it, it has logarithmic correction. So it behaves like square root of, of, of t times some power of log t as t goes to infinity. So this is a very informal formulation. I will come to a more precise one in one slide. But the message here is that somehow if you, if you hope to get some, uh, to, uh, to see some, some, some scale behavior of the system, you should not rescale things diffusively, but this, the diffusive rescaling has to be corrected somehow logarithmically by some correction with some power delta, which we don't know. I mean, I have a conjecture where we'll, we will see in a second. Okay, so this is a, the message is there are some logarithmic uh, corrections to, super, to diffusivity as soon as the nonlinearity is there. Okay, so let me see uh, the actual theorem. So again, this is the definition as before. Um, and v, this V phi epsilon lambda just tells you how, what is the, what is the variance of the increase of this H t uh, between time H, uh, H of phi between time zero and time t, and uh, rem rem remember that this function here is independent of epsilon uh, for lambda equals zero. Okay, so uh, a first more a closer uh, a closer approximation to our actual theorem is that as follows: that as soon as uh, there is uh, lambda is not zero, then uh, this uh, variance is macroscopically positive already for times of order one over log epsilon to the power minus delta, uh, one over log epsilon to the power delta. So 
this thing here for such small times for the linear equation this, this this quantity would be just zero i mean up to that time nothing has happened for the linear equation but what this is telling you here is that uh, for the non-linear equation already on these very small times well kind of small times already there has been a non-linear and a non-trivial a non-trivial non evolution on the other hand the second part of the theorem says that if you if you study if you if time is too small like uh one uh, one over log epsilon to the power minus one minus delta then nothing actually has happened so somehow this is telling you that the right behave somehow the interesting behavior should happen on times of order one over epsilon squared log uh log to some power delta and this delta is neither one nor zero this is what this is saying okay so maybe a more concrete uh, a more concrete uh, consequence Let, to take the function h uh, integrate against phi and then this is saying that as soon as you wait a, a time of order one of the log epsilon to the delta the covariance of this function with the value it had initially has already become macroscopically smaller than a time zero so this ratio of covariances on the denominator you have just time zero in the numerator you have a covariance between time zero and time one over log epsilon to the delta this is already strictly smaller than one even in the limit epsilon go to zero and L goes to infinity. So there is really a decorrelation taking place very, very quickly. So somehow to see a limit process, uh, so presumably there is one, you have to take times which are not, not diffusive, but logarithmically super diffusive. Okay, uh, right. Um, let me try to, to get to the second, the second theorem, which is maybe more, uh, possibly more intuitive. Uh, and it is goes, uh, that is another way of determining whether the process is diffusive or super diffusive is through the so-called bulk diffusion coefficient. So if you have some diffusion process, some particle moving in a medium, uh, say it is, has a, it is in a random way, but in a centered way, uh, you can uh, define it, you can just look at it, it's mean square displacement and uh, at time t uh, like here, and uh, say, well, define it to be t times d of t. Of course, if, if it was just a Brownian motion, this thing would just be t. And in fact, it would have a normal diffusion. So d would be about a fixed one. But I mean, this thing, this d of t could uh, diverge itself with t, in which case the process would be super diffusive and or it could go to zero, it would be sub diffusive. Okay, so this would be for a particle moving randomly uh, without a, with a, with a kind of without any, any, any overall trip. Okay, so can we do something similar for our equation? In, in, this, in our equation, there is no particle moving. Okay, so the analogous uh, definition of a, of a diffusion coefficient uh, works as follows for the KPZ equation. We want to define these bulk diffusion coefficients as somehow uh, made in a similar way to what would be done for a single particle, except that instead of having this uh, transition kernel PT of zero X, the transition kernel from time zero to time T, would have some CT of zero X, where this CT of zero X would be ideally some measure the correlations between certain observable at time zero at the position zero and some observable at position X at time T. Okay, this was what one would like to, and this kind of thing would measure, if you look at how this quantity grows with T, it would measure how correlations grow spread in space with T. In fact, through this quantity here, you can define, you can, you can define it to be, uh, Essentially, the square of the of the correlation of the correlation length. Okay, All right. But what 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 should be the CT for us? Well, a good candidate for us is if you if instead of looking at H, the solution of the equation, you look at H where you apply minus the square root of the Laplacian. Uh, what happens is that uh, since H at all times is a Gaussian-free field, U is instead of white noise, so it's delta correlated at equal times. So and if you def if you define this ct zero x as the correlation between u t x and u zero zero, at time zero is just a direct function. At time at later times it measures somehow how correlations spread in the in space and time, and then uh, well we we adopt as a as a definition of of uh, of uh, bulk diffusivity coefficients, what is written here with this with this choice of ct. So somehow. Uh, this this bulk diffusivity coefficient tells you how how fast correlations are spreading out in in space in in, in space uh, uh, when time grows. Okay, uh, here we'll skip half slide because I see I'm already almost over time. 
And once you, you, you take the definition, what the second theorem is that uh, these bulk diffusivity coefficients, which, by the way, so this, this d bulk of t equals exactly one for the linear equation, so the, which again translates the fact that the linear equation is exactly diffusive. And uh, for the nonlinear equation, as soon as lambda is different from zero, here I forgot to write it, uh, this d bulk grows logarithmically with t. As at most as log t to some delta and at most as log t to some one or minus delta for some delta, which is positive. Okay, so it's written here. Can, can I ask a question sure. at this, this point or? Well, sure. Yeah, yeah, uh, sure. I, I'm slightly confused by the role of the epsilon. So in this result, there, there is no epsilon. Does it hold for any, any positive epsilon? Uh, as well? Uh, so, or... if, so if, for the th second theorem, uh, let, let's look, I'm just looking at the equation without rescaling anything. So it's like, uh, so here I, I'm just, uh, in this second theorem, there is no epsilon. Uh, no, so. Um, or the other. Be the... Because somehow the epsilon appeared in two places earlier, right? On the one hand, it was appeared in the rescaling. On the other hand, it also, if I remember correctly, it somehow appeared in the Fourier cutoff of the nonlinearity. Uh, well, no. In the original equation, you just you cut off the nonlinearity at one. So okay, I there see. is no so, And then uh, the, only once you 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 change you do the uh, once you do the diffusive rescaling, then uh, the equation of the rescale thing uh, has a cutoff which is at one over epsilon. But uh, the original equation has no epsilon. The cutoff is at one. Okay, so so the last theorem is is there's no epsilon in, in the formulation. The last theorem there is no epsilon. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. All right. So yeah. The, the right. regularization of the initial equation has no epsilon. It's only once you change time space time that uh, it's equivalent to uh, to to making a, a cutoff at one over epsilon. Yeah. Okay. But in the last uh, theorem, uh, there is a cutoff at one. A fixed cutoff. There is a cutoff at one, but then you are looking at large scales. Yes, there is yeah. a cutoff at one. Yes, here the cutoff is at one. Okay, th uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, so, uh, but th by the way, this is exactly the sa same kind of thing that is done in higher, I mean, in, the, 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 in, the, in the results I mentioned on dimension D and high, three and higher. So they, 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 they fix a cutoff for the initial equation, and then they rescale the equation. And then once you rescale, it's like if the cutoff were, were, were disappearing, but the equation is regularized initially once and for all. So it's exactly the same thing that is done there. OK, uh, right. So this second theory is telling you how the, how the diffusion coefficient is, is, is diverging. And uh, OK, so. Uh, what we conjecture is that uh, the optimal delta should be one half, so that this diffusion coefficient should diverge like square root of log delta. And we, we cannot prove that, but uh, okay, good in, well, anyway. Uh, but what we can say is that this delta is uniformly positive, uniformly in lambda. So when lambda goes to zero, this delta does not go to zero. So there is really this continuity of this delta, which is zero at lambda equals zero and non zero immediately, so somehow it jumps to some positive. So some positive value that we conjecture to be to, to be one half. Uh, uh, okay, I, I see. Uh, I, I want just to. I think it can give can give some more perspective uh, th this slide. I mean, I will not enter into any details of the proof unless I mean, of course, there are questions. But I would like to. There's questions. Uh, just there are some echo. Uh, anyway, so uh, I just wanted to make a, a remark with. Uh, uh, trying to connect with some other uh, logarithmic superdiffusivity phenomena in 2D systems. Uh, there are other 2D systems which are known or conjectured to be uh, uh, superdiffusive. So the first one is a two-dimensional uh, uh, asymmetric simple exclusion. So you, you take particles jumping on a lattice with exclusion rule and with a drift. In that case, you can again consider uh, introduce the so-called bulk diffusivity coefficients, which is very similarly uh, introduced as I did here. Just you, you look at fluctuations and uh, correlations of, uh, of particle, uh, particle occupations. And uh, in that case, it was uh, conjectured by Van Beren and Spohn that this uh, coefficient diverges logarith as log of two to the power two over three. And that was, uh, that was proven by Yao uh, around 15 years ago. And actually our method of proof is takes a lot of inspirations from Yao's method. 
there are other cases where these log corrections are, are, are expected. One, one of them is two-dimensional fluids, like uh, you imagine hard disks uh, colliding uh, on, 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 on plane. In that case, it has been uh, conjectures like 15 year, 50 years ago that um, that the diffusive that diffusion there should be logarithmic cor corrections to diffusion to diffusion of order square root of log time, and uh, as far as I know, it is, the mathematical status is very uh, primitive here. There are some log log bounds uh, for some discrete lattice gas models, uh, like 15 years ago, also. And also, if you uh, for systems like you have a tracer particle that diffuses in a random vector field given by the curl of a two-dimensional Gaussian free field, which is divergence free, it is conjectural that such tracer will uh, super diffuse with the uh, back diffusivity coefficients of order square root of log t. But also there, there are very uh, pessimistic bounds between log log and log by Tot and Valko. And uh, somehow um, our, our IKPZ equation should fall uh, in the same class as these two systems here, where the uh, conjectural behavior is square root of log t, while the, the AZ case with the two thirds is a, has a, there is a different mechanism behind. Okay, so but still there are some similar similar type of uh, of results expected or proven in, in for other two dimensional uh, out of equilibrium systems. So somehow this logarithmic diff, uh, super diffusive for AKPZ does not come out of the blue, even though it was not really predicted in the in the literature as far as uh, could find. Okay, and then that's it. I mean, uh, of course, we would like to prove that delta is well equal one half. Uh, more than that, we would like to understand if the limit process, there exists a limit process, is it still Gaussian that could still be? And then uh, last thing, we would like to, to prove similar results for microscopic growth models in the same university class. There are certain models that are somehow assumed, uh, believed to behave, uh, certain discrete growth models that are, that are believed to behave like the IKPZ SPD. But for that, for those models, it's not proven that uh, there is super diffusivity, but uh, that would be, uh, we think, extremely interesting. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much indeed for this beautiful presentation. Are there questions? I, I have another one. Uh, okay, Roland. Um, so you used a very specific uh, regularization of the nonlinearity, uh, in particular one um, that was uh, made in such a way that the invariant measure is the free field, right? I, I imagine if you use a sort of generic regularization of the nonlinearity, uh, the invariant me measure isn't necessarily a free field. Is, is this important in uh, uh, tech, your analysis? Uh, uh, yeah, technically it's important that uh... Uh, okay, so there are other, regulariz uh, other regularization that would work. We could uh, regularize the noise instead. Um, but, but you uh, need but, uh, the invariant measure to be a free You field. need, yeah, you need, for instance, you need, um, yeah, for that to hold, uh, you, we need, uh, for instance, that this cutoff, uh, even if you stay in Fourier, if you take a very uh, a random cutoff, so to speak, uh, arbitrary cutoff, it would not work. So the minimal thing we need is that this cutoff function is uh, symmetric on the exchange of the two coordinates. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if, if you take it a bit uh, non-symmetric, the, the property that the Gaussian free field is exactly invariant fails. And then I can imagine that you could somehow uh, still make it work, but, uh, but we use it. So you expect the result to be true, even if you use a regular, I mean, even if, I mean. I would expect the result to be true. Now, I, I'm not sure I expect the techniques to, uh, there will be the extra difficulties, that's for sure. But, uh, well, so reasonably, sense, I, reasonably that, I would. And uh, I guess if you have, uh, instead of the, the second, so you have a quadratic nonlinearity in the equation. If, if you were to add, uh, like, say, a higher order terms as well, uh, of course, then again, uh, you, the free field is not going to be invariant. But do you, is, would you expect the result still to be true? Or is this? Uh, um, uh, this uh, yeah, even, uh, even without going to non quadratic, I would say. So take, suppose you take Q to be uh, the diagonal matrix one and minus two, okay? Yes. In that case, it's expected that, that on large scales, the behavior is similar, it's in, in some way similar. It's, there is no uh, very precise conjecture. But in that case, the stationary state will not be Gaussian. 
Uh, it could be, it could be, uh, I mean, this is something that could be, is that the stationary state will not be Gaussian, but somehow will be Gaussian large scales. So what is special of this, uh, of this Q is that they are exactly Gaussian at all scales. Uh, what I can imagine is that uh, if either you break a little bit, uh, you, you, you regularize in non, not, not so nice way, or you change Q, that, uh, yeah, as I said, uh, only on large scales, uh, things will be Gaussian, but, but not exactly. So, but somehow it's, it's, it's at least the physics, uh, the physics the conjecture is that, uh, is that as soon as this determinant is, is the negative is smaller than zero, then, uh, then uh, that, that, that is the only thing that should matter. But, but uh, yeah, technically it matters that we have the, that we have the Gaussian, the Gaussian stationary state. There might be some higher order, higher order nonlinearities that still preserve the Gaussian, the Gaussian thing. I, uh, I cannot tell you now, but I, I don't know. Uh, but see, not a generic thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was. I was most. I mean, I understand that technically, uh, it's uh, probably very important to have the free field as an invariant measure. I was just wondering how much um, this is More, expected yeah. to matter in the end or not, uh, or if it's a, if it's technical. It's a, or, but uh, I think you I mean the 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 the, the, the 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 this conjecture by Wolf was was arose from some uh, renormalization, one loop, uh, renormalization group type uh, computation, and they don't use that, uh, that, uh, the, the, that the stationary state is, is, is stationary. The, the Gauss, what did they say? Anyway, the stationary state is Gaussian. They just use the, the sign of this term. So in this sense, it, sh it should not matter, but uh, yeah, but uh, I mean, even, so uh, let me go back uh, once more to this higher dimensional results on KPZ and dimensional at least three. Also there, it should not matter that the matrix Q is the identity, but uh, if, you, if Q is not identity, you cannot do call hop and then, uh, and then, uh, and then that's it. Uh, so also there, it should not matter, but, but then in practice, it's uh, for the proof it's matter. it matters. But I agree, it should not, it should not. Uh, Okay, thank you. Thank you. Further questions? Yes. Al. So, yeah, what is the heuristic argument that leads you to this conjecture delta equal one half? Is there like oh, yes. heuristic renormalization group argument? Uh, it's, uh, no, it's, even, it's, it's simpler. It's, uh, it's um... okay, let me think of it a second. Um, uh, you want to, uh, th there is essentially a, a, a something called a, uh, mode coupling approximation. So uh, uh -huh. you, you you write down essentially uh, uh, you write down the okay you, you call uh, you write okay so maybe I can try you take something like uh, call I don't know s of k t something like the expectation of uh, the okay let me okay let me write it down. Okay, zero minus k. So you take the, the covariance, the correlation between the kth Fourier component of the solution at time t and the same thing at time zero. You have to take k and minus k otherwise. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you call this skt. And then you, you, you can write down what is the, okay, so for in the linear equation, it just, uh, it, the solution is something, it behaves like it's like e to the minus k square mm -hmm. over t or something. Mm -hmm. like that. And then what you do is you write down a, 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 an equation for, for this s. Just putting in the 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 equation for 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 h, okay, mm -hmm. okay. So there is an initial step where you just use the equation, and then okay, the, the equation is is nonlinear, of course, as you can expect. And actually, it's worse than that. There will be a term of the type which involves four four fields, something like mm -hmm. h h h h. Okay, so in this sense, it's not a closed equation for s. If at this if at that moment moment you make a Gaussian approximation, you say well. Mm -hmm. Suppose the H's are still Gaussian, then you factorize, you just apply Vick's, uh, Vick's formula. And then at, at, at that moment, the, the, the equation closes, then you solve it and you will find that, uh, that uh, you will find the square root log T uh, behavior mm -hmm. for the, mm -hmm. this is, so it's really, if you want a Gaussian approximation at some point, which is, which can, can, can be reasonable. I mean, in a sense, uh, somehow the, if the, if the, if the model is non-Gaussian, it's, it's weakly so, so I mean, the, 
it's not a crazy approximation. Hmm. But but uh, but uh, yeah, the, the 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 initial physics paper. I mean, we didn't find this. We found a similar heuristics by Spohn and Van Beren for for two-dimensional ASEP, but not for AKPZ. We didn't see this this type of heuristics anywhere. So, but it's one page. It's on it's on mm -hmm. the paper. We, we give it in there in the, in the appendix. But does your proof look like this or? No, no. Is the proof uh, totally different? Yeah, it's very, it's, it's totally different. So, so the way it works, for instance, for the for the uh, diffusion coefficient, the first thing to do is to, okay, you have this the bulk of t, and uh, okay, first of all, we, we we look at it in Fourier in in Laplace transform. Okay, so it does something like this, and then it's uh, it takes uh, okay a couple of lines to rewrite it in terms of the generator. So it, it involves something like. Uh, uh, you can write it as uh, something like uh, oops, uh, the expectation of the nonlinearity, this uh, the no regularized nonlinearity. Then you have the inverse of the of the generator of the process, and and again the nonlinearity. Okay, so you have to 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 study the inverse of the generator. So this this step is is is, is kind of standard, and then you. you Somehow, all the all the thing is to to get bounds on the inverse of this gen of the generator of the process, and for that there is a, a kind of uh, 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 iterative method to get lower and upper bounds on this inverse, so to speak, uh, mm -hmm. which gives lower and upper bounds on the on the diffusion coefficients, and then once you iterate uh, and uh, careful enough, you these bounds uh, kind of approach each other. Ideally, they will approach a square root log t behavior. For technical reasons, they don't. They they just approach this log t to the delta and log t to the one minus delta. So anyway, so the, the basics is the study of the inverse of this uh, of this generator. So nothing to do with this Gaussian approximation. I would mm. say. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Are there further questions? Uh, is it possible to describe uh, a physical problem? Uh, described by by this uh, equation this an uh, anisotropic yes. equation yes yes it, it uh, i mean physical i don't know how physical you want it but uh, there are some uh, uh, okay so what i can tell you is is one microscopic model where which should behave like this equation and then in the paper by by wolf he mentions some situations of crystal growth where you the incident beam of molecules in molecules is very asymmetric with respect to the axis of the crystals, stuff like that, which should be described by this isotopic equation. So there is actually some apparently some some actually very physical uh, situation where this uh, anisotropic uh, equation is relevant. You, you, I, I don't, I cannot tell you more than this, but it's it's mentioned in this paper by Wolf. But for instance, one model, one microscopic model that should fall into the same universality class is a two-dimensional generalization of, if you know what uh, the, the uh, um, uh, for those who know what the polynuclear growth is, then I mean, polynuclear growth, you have a, a one-dimensional interface where uh, you have this kind of terraces that move with speed, unit, unit speed, and they kind of annihilate when they collide. Plus you have uh, new terraces, uh, appearing with Poissonian rates, and then they immediately start to uh, start to grow. So this is so-called uh, PN polynuclear growth model. And you can imagine uh, a two-dimensional generalization of this, where you have seven, infinitely many of these lines, which you can see as, uh, um, how to say, uh, level lines of an interface. Each of them follows a PNG, except that uh, they are, they are they, they, these lines cannot intersect, OK? And this, this okay, I'm, I'm being a bit rough, but this model has a name. It's called Gates Westcott model, and uh, it is expected. And actually, there are strong indications that it belongs to the same universality class as the AKPZ equation. In particular, you can compute its speed of growth as a function of the slope. You compute the Hessian, you compute the determinant, uh, and then uh, the, the okay, and it turns out to be negative. So it should fall into the into that universality class. And there are other other example of other um, other microscopic models that uh, fall in the same class. And they said there are apparently some actual physical situations where uh, where where this class is relevant. But uh, I would say, uh, from my point of view, it's more the, more the, uh, the the mathematical interest of this. But thank you. Okay. Thank you. Further questions? <laughs>